Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Future Tech podcast series. It's me, Charlie Sell, the Group MD for Arrows Group, where I run a podcast uh, interviewing, speaking, getting the thoughts of leaders within um, technology businesses, looking at everything from technology stacks through to people and culture and understanding a bit of their story and that all important career advice at the end for, for many of our listeners. And I'm really pleased to have Casper Spiro with me today. Casper is the CEO of Easy Generator. Easy Generator is a global online e-learning uh, platform, an all-trading platform for knowledge experts. Um, and catching up with Casper just before the podcast, it's, it's incredible to hear how many countries they work in, um, even though they're based from Dubai and uh, the Netherlands. Um, and, and how technology provides a global reach. So it really is quite an interesting um, part of, of how uh, the world is formed today. Casper, welcome to the show. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks for having me. So let's jump straight in and tell us a bit about your story. How did you get into technology and ultimately become CEO of Easy Generator? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a long story because <laughs> I have a working history of 40 years. But to keep it short, I started out as a teacher. Uh, and when I was still, uh, I, I didn't even finish my, my study yet. And I was asked to teach uh, unemployed people in Rotterdam to teach them bookkeeping, uh, accountancy. I was actually at that time uh, becoming a teacher, social studies and economics. Um, and uh, at that, the moment that I was asked, by the way, for the job, uh, I, I was in my last year, but I didn't uh, succeed to pass any of the bookkeeping uh, uh, exams because I really hated it. But the thing that I learned is that uh, working with uh, uh, unmotivated kids uh, in high schools wasn't really my thing. And this was a chance to work with groups of 20 people who are unemployed. It was bookkeeping, accountancy, but also on a computer already. So that was the first link with technology. And it was 1985, so it was really advanced. It was a six-month course that, and I had to, by the way, build that course myself because it wasn't there. And um, if they would make a, the, finish the course successfully, they would have a job guaranteed. And at that time, there was a huge unemployment. So it was really interesting to work with them. And it was already my first connection to technology because I was working with uh, online bookkeeping programs or, or basically well on PCs they were running. Um, and um, because it was completely new, uh, I also started writing books. So I started writing a couple of books that were published, uh, so, the, so uh, the textbooks for that. And I did that for five years. We built it out and we, we ran that in a couple of cities. And after five years, I was sort of, okay, yeah, I want to do a next step. And because I wrote the books, I actually applied to become a technical writer with a, a, a company uh, called Informat. Um, but in the conversations I had with their CEO, it was a really small company, like 15 people at the time. Uh, and they said, well, what we want to do, we want to move in a new direction. We want to work on knowledge management systems and, and other systems that people will support. So we have a couple of questions from customers. We really don't know what to do with that. So uh, maybe something for you to just uh, go there and start designing those systems. So I became an information designer there. So for example, what we did, um, I was going to uh, the port of Rotterdam where they have an automated uh, terminal. Uh, there need to be like a, a procedure system capturing the interaction between the people and all those automated guided vehicles. Uh, and then I would come up with a solution. We build that and we would make sure the information was there. So that was sort of the second thing. Well, the journey took on after that. I uh, also was in the first internet hype. I sort of built a, a Dutch Google Maps before Google did. Uh, it was called Locative. It's still there, by the way. So I, I actually uh, was already in the internet hype pretty early. And after that, I, I went more and more into e-learning. Uh, had a couple of things in my own company, but uh, the, the biggest experience before Easy Generator, I was working at a company that was representing a lot of e-learning technology companies in the Netherlands. And uh, that uh, triggered a couple of things that I'm now currently doing different as Easy Generator, because it was sort of an example of what I didn't want. So we're working with a large company, so I will not name them because I don't want to, 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 to blame them, but the really big e-learning things. And we were between our customers in the Netherlands and those providers were usually in the States. And basically they couldn't care less about our customers. So if they had a bug or an issue or a wish, and we would try to get, bring that across, 
I said, well, if you look at uh, the stock market, we're doing okay, so <laughs> why bother? So the service was really horrible. So that was one of the things I learned that I want to do that in a different way. Um, and in that process, I actually encountered uh, uh, the Easy Generator because it was a tool we were looking for a simple authoring tool to start reselling in the, in the Netherlands. And Easy Generator was a, a Dutch-based authoring tool that just did that. And uh, in that process, uh, well, it, it ended up that they asked me, uh, do you want to become our CEO? So I decided that it would be a really nice chance to indeed do a couple of things different and uh, sort of uh, take lead of that. So it was already an existing company when I joined in uh, 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 2010, so it's 11 years ago. Um, and uh, we had what we call a Windows version. So it was like Windows software running uh, on the computers, but all the data was already online. And we were selling that in the Netherlands and Germany. And my job was to really make it uh, a global thing. And that didn't work. So we were competing in the infrastructure. So if you create e-learning, you have people who have knowledge in the business. And then have your learning department where you have instructional designers who create e-learning. So they interview people in the business and with that, uh, they get the information, they create a course and then they publish it. And that has to be really nice and shiny. So it's like really uh, a lot of features, really a, a complex software. And we were competing with big companies like Adobe and uh, the really billion dollar company. And we were like tiny, I was, we were like four people at that time. So that is uh, something that was hard. So we tried to actually make it work um, and start selling in the States and stuff like that. And we were a bit successful, but uh, it, yeah, we made some improvement, but it was not what I came for, not what the shareholders were looking for. So basically it was a failure. Uh, so after two and a half years, I told them, okay, I think we should stop. And I was basically already, it was a half an eye looking for another job because I said, that was it. it. We just didn't make it. But I did learn a couple of things in the meantime. And that is that the whole process of relearning, that, that doesn't work. It's too slow. If I want to know how to create a, do a podcast, I would interview you and other people, and then I create a course on that. But you learn something new tomorrow. You use new software or you get a new insight. I don't know that. So not only is the process really slow and expensive to create your learning, it's also a recipe for disaster because it will always be outdated. So my conclusion was we teach, we spend a lot of time and money to teach people outdated stuff. And I hate that. And I have a simple solution. So, so I, I basically told the shareholders at that time, okay, so we should stop, but I have another idea, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, if we just um, make a tool that uh, Charlie can create uh, an e-learning course on how to do a proper podcast himself and keep that up to date, and not a fancy tool, but a really, really simple tool, 100% web-based and from day one, a global thing, that would be awesome. And to my surprise, said, yeah, let's go for that. So let's stop everything we do. So we stop selling the tool we have. We stop the, we start from scratch. And we actually started in 2013 building that um, with a small team in Ukraine uh, with uh, just four developers and me. And that was the whole company at that time. And then um, because we know that the Netherlands is too small to actually be a successful software company, and we decided, okay, we are a global company from day one. Although we had only myself in Rotterdam and four people in Ukraine, uh, we decided that uh, we, we did the launch in Las Vegas, for example. So on, on the DevLearn, it's one of the biggest uh, e-learning events in the world. And that is where we launched. And uh, until the day of today, the US is still our biggest market. So the UK is the second. I think the Netherlands is third. Uh, but we are in over 50 countries over the whole world, uh, selling to, to, to pretty large companies. Uh, and now we also have, because, uh, well, uh, we will talk about it probably later, but well, having the right people on board is the key thing to be successful. And that became harder and harder because we grow like 75 to 100% every year, uh, which is a challenge uh, to get the right people and to, to keep them on board. So a year and a bit more than a year ago, we opened up an office in Dubai. And right now there are already, I think, 50 or 60 people there working. And that helps us really to, to get the growth uh, continuing. So, uh, yeah, so we have offices now in Shitomir in, in Ukraine, which, by the way, of course, yeah, extremely hard at the moment because, uh, yeah, the, the war going on there. So that's a big concern. Uh, we have an office in Rotterdam still, and we have an office in, uh, in Dubai, and we are setting up an office in Colombia uh, to sort of uh, be closer to the American time zone for, for support. And what we do is uh, we, we, we have an altering tool for severe experts. Uh, that is being used by mainly large companies. I think we have like 1,400 customers now, 1,500, something like that. Um, it is extremely simple. So the lack of feature is the main feature. 
That's uh, and that's yeah. also the challenge to, to keep it simple. Um, uh, so anyone would be able to create content uh, without any training. We have 24, uh, 24 five support uh, connected to it. Um, and um, yeah, I think that yeah, growing uh, still really, really fast. 100% uh, SaaS solution, 100% online. Also the sales process, everything we do is, uh, is digital. Yeah, we are a paperless company. We don't own a printer. We don't own a cover word to, to store paper. We don't, just don't have it. Everything is digital. Yeah, from day one. Fantastic! Wow. Um, and yeah, well, hey, what a story! But also, what a what what a, what a great learning curve throughout your career. You know, just just listening to you, the, the the thing that I was picking out of that was, you know, when when something doesn't work, rather than throw the towel in, come up with a solution. So when you realize that the 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 old school learning e learning platform wasn't working, but rather than saying to the shareholders let's let's just cancel this and move on you you, you presented a solution to to then re-energize and, and rejuvenate the the concept and and that sort of entrepreneurial spirit and, and being solution focused is is something that i think for many of our listeners is is a really important learning you know it's it's there's nothing wrong with failing but if you fail learn from what happens and and create something better um correct um, yeah, it's e even stronger than that. I think failure should be one of your objectives. So at least generally, we have a couple of company values, uh, and one of them is uh, experimentation. And the goal of an experiment is to try something out, and in principle, it will fail, but you will learn from it, so you will be able to do it better next time. And that is the, the key thing, If also if you are looking at your own, uh, well, if you basically are building your career, uh, there will be failure, there will be successes, but probably you will get the most out of your failures. That's where you learn. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and, and the other bit, that, and we were actually talking about this before, just whilst we are kicking off the podcast, that as you mentioned, you're totally paperless. You're, you've been a technology, you've actually been a remote business prior to COVID. It's been your plan ever since you, you, you started the concept. So when we were discussing Correct. a little bit about... Uh, you know, um, using multiple platforms, and 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 for you, you were saying, well, it's 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 how we've operated. Um, yeah. I guess that's a really nice bit to focus on. Then thinking about people, because for many of our listeners, but actually for many of our clients who who had to learn very quickly how to build a successful culture and and company on a on a remote first basis, what what's what's been your trick thinking about the people and then how you've been able to build these teams in ukraine dubai how have you been able to maintain that culture and what what what, what learnings have you have you had so uh a couple of things so communication is everything so for us for example we use a tool like slack already for a long time which is a communication channel where we do a lot of stuff there but we also do really cool things there so uh, what we have for so well i talked about the values we have four values experimentation is one of them but ownership and so we have four of them and you want to make that alive especially if you are a, a, a company which is not in one place you so you can't enforce it yourself all the time so what we did but on those values we came, we created value cards those cards are like cards with a quote from a famous person that sort of underlines the value that we have um so uh, for example we have a quote from somebody saying an experiment uh, that doesn't feel is not an experiment something like that and then a famous and we made a nice card out of that and what we do actually is we give people praise so if you would behave accordingly to a value i would actually drag one of those cards uh, uh into slack tag you and give you praise for that so i will explain what you did was I think was so awesome. And it does two things. So it will actually empower you and 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 let you know how much I appreciate that in front of everybody. We create like a separate channel for that, our value recognition channel. And at the same time, we sort of make the values, we, we get live everyday new live examples on what kind of behavior is actually meant with those values. So you 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 make them alive. But that's something that's pretty awesome. I really like that. Yeah. So things like that are really important to sort of build a culture. And I remember, so I told you, we built the office in Dubai. Uh, it was like, in, I think in November, uh, not last year, but the year before. So it's now like 15, 16 months. And due to COVID, I wasn't there until April. So when I entered the office, we were having like, there were 20 people or something like that. And it was really cool because I fly from the Netherlands. Uh, so I'm working from home most of the time, as you can see. I fly uh, to Dubai uh, at a, in a strange hotel. I walk for a while, go into a big tower, enter a room, and I'm 
at Easy Generator. It was the same vibe, the same culture we have in Rotterdam. And one of the things that really helped is that one or two people from Rotterdam office actually were willing to move to Dubai. So they actually brought the culture. So we were able to sort of inject that. But those kind of things are really important. So it's really the people that make that connection. And it's also yeah, the mindset that you have indeed, because we are an online company in everything we do from day one, you really need to work extra hard to, to, to make that communication happen. So, for example, well, if we talk about uh, the, the Ukrainian office, um, I probably was there for like, I don't know, 30, 40 times in the last 10 years or something like that. So you also have to actually be there because that is also something which adds an extra layer. So you can't do everything online. You can build a lot of information, uh, transfer a lot of information, you can build a lot of trust. But if you want to make big steps and if you want to show your commitment, you actually also have to be on site. So that's the other thing that, uh, yeah, that, that is really important to show you that, that you care by also going there and spending time there and getting to know people and, and just have dinner in the evening with them and stuff like that. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, coincidentally, I'm, I'm hosting this podcast from our Netherlands office in Amsterdam um, for that exact same reason. Once the, co- the, the corridors opened again, you, you can't beat what, what we call the water cooler chats or the coffee chats, the, those little connection points. And, um, yeah. and, and on your point about communication, again, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I don't know if you'd agree with this, but one thing I learned was when you had face-to-face meetings, you always had the five minutes before the meeting started or the five minutes after where you could do the personal connections. How's the family? How's, how are your parents? How's, how are things going on? When you move straight into then a world of VC and, and meetings start at a time, you go straight into the conversation, they end at a time. If you don't think about the, the relationship building part and, and, and how you can build that, you, you lose the culture. So, so what I love from what you said, using Slack and having a recognition channel where, where you can give people the pats on the back, the recognition, the forums, that, that's, that's priceless. So you can't put a value to it, a, a financial value to it, but it, it is just such an important thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, correct. And uh... Yeah, and I agree with you. So uh, it goes with, indeed, if I have conversations with my, my colleagues, but it's also with conversations with customers, you always start with like a bit of small talk uh, and free help. So I remember our first big American customer that we landed was, was Nielsen. Uh, so that's the data consumer company that was the first uh, breakthrough in America that we have a big corporate and an American company that uh, was started to use Easy Generator. And I worked with them really intensely for like two years and it was our launching customer. So a lot of things needed to be uh, adjusted. So I, I, the, it was quite an intense work rate. They were 100% online. And then after one of them, uh, Laura and me uh, presented on that business case at an e-learner conference in the States. It was the first time we met. And it's really strange because I met her, but it was somebody I was talking to for two years every week. So we knew each other pretty well. We knew the, about each other's kids and the dog and everything but then yeah well you encounter somebody that you know pretty well but you're completely strangers to each other so it's really fun yeah Yeah. so you can build a lot but it is then also really awesome to meet in face yeah and that's great and i think i think the world is going to normalize eventually where where we'll have that perfect blend hopefully where where people are empowered by remote working and for a lot of our listeners graduates who will be entering the world of work it's for them it's it's going to be as uh, a new life it, it, they won't see anything different you know the remote the, the, the flexible working life yep. but everyone needs to be aware of, of the importance of building relationships otherwise you become isolated and um and yeah some of the stories what, what you've talked about that, that's just learnings that that can go across everyone clients stem graduates everyone um correct yeah by the way what you say there is really interesting because that's one of the things that i really learned is that uh, the world's not black and white but much more there are nuances there so it goes, for example, for, for e-learning. So e-learning is not the solution because it has certain value, but face-to-face learning has other values. So the combination, the blend of the two is probably the best. The same goes for working. So remote working has its advantages, but also disadvantages and face-to-face working. So you have to blend it. So I really believe that it's not one thing that has the ultimate truth, but you need to pick the best from both and then combine it, and then you get the very best. 
and again, I just couldn't agree with you more. Um, and it's and every company will, will have its slight nuances. Some company, there's nothing wrong with with one company being a bit more remote or, or a bit less. It's, it's but it's finding that blend that works for you. And and I guess moving on to the last part of our podcast, where we, we'll look at the career advice to graduates. A, a thing that I talk about a lot is the culture of the business is so important. So when you're looking at at a company to join, it needs to do the culture that you are so if you're someone who who needs to be around people and, and wants to be in a physical location then then that will be part of your decision factors of the company you join versus and and that's why you need to go more than just the technology that a business does or the or, or where they are in the market you've really got to feel what the company's about um and so moving yeah, on right. to that for you what what are the two bits of the few bits of advice when you're thinking, you know, for for many of our listeners, what, what bit of advice could you give them about how they could get their fit in the door? Well, I think that connected to the last thing you said, so if you are a graduate and you're looking for first, so at this generator, we have a lot of people who are sort of starters. So for example, our uh, business development representatives uh, usually are fresh from university. Uh, uh, so and what what you need there is that you need to indeed really be cautious about the company you want to work for in your first job. You want to have a place where you fit. You want to have a place where you're challenged. You want to have a place where you can grow. So we know, for example, that in that role, people stay there for like a year and then they need to have a new opportunity because we grow that fast, the new opportunity will actually arrive. And not everybody will stay after the year, but most of them will and actually grow into marketing or sales or whatever role uh, we have in the company. So it's also a great channel for new talent in. I think that is if you are looking for your first job, indeed, make sure you have a company that has that match in culture, in, in, in ambition, uh, in potential growth, uh, in, in, in chances that you will get, because uh, that will help you to, to an, an, an awesome start of your career. I think that that is really, really important. And be, be really tricked. So, for example, at DC Generator, I said, well, a lot of things are blended. Not everything is blended. So, for example, some things are really black and white. So we decided from day one when we relaunched the company, we are a 100% SaaS company. So our software is online. So just this morning, we did an update. So every customer now has new software and it will happen next week again. And so uh, so uh, that is one. But the other thing is also we are completely focused on subscriptions. So the only source that we have is subscription. People buy a subscription on the software for a month or a year, and then it will renew. So as long as they don't churn, we have an awesome business model, model because it grows really fast. But in that, we don't make any compromises. That is just it. So you need to have like your core conviction and make sure that you have great focus on what you do. And at the other hand, you need also to be willing to blend in the things where, where you think that that has value. So it's that, that, that's sort of a balance you have to find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, this is just so interesting because it, it's so clear that you've got you've got a really clear views on um on, on how to build that successful business model and and to have that 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 amb- that that, that austerity where where some of the things are fixed at your pricing model, your 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 service and therefore clients and 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 uh, have a really clear view of what they need to do. But the cultural wise, you blend it. It's, it's- Correct. Yeah, and 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 the, the the yeah. I think the ultimate thing uh, in the success of our company is the people. Indeed. So we now have about 150 people working for us. Uh, still growing rapidly. So uh, um, last month we hired 50 more. I think something like that. The last two months. So it's going pretty fast. Um, but that is something we spend a lot of time on, making sure it's not only a match. So we don't really hire. Yeah, sometimes you hire, of course, on, on experience, but most of the time we hire on talent and if it's a fit for the company, so culture-wise. Because if that's there and people have to, uh, the willingness to learn, then probably we can do everything. And also that is something that, uh, well, just uh, remember if you are a graduate and you're going to work, uh, most people actually have a job that didn't exist when they were finishing their study. So if you look at myself, uh, I was a teacher. At that time, you had mainframes. You didn't have it. It was just a personal computer was just coming up. There was no thing as internet. We didn't have email. Uh, and now I, I, I run a, a, a 100% online company, something I couldn't even imagine 
when I started working. So uh, always know that what you're going to do is something completely new. And so that in 20 years time, the world will be so different. So just build up your experience and learn from it and, and constantly evolve. So I'm learning every day. And if you stop learning, then uh, basically your career also will stop. Yeah. And again, what, what a brilliant um, closing comment, I guess, because it's, it's just so true, you know, the, and both of us being in the world of technology, I think technology is epitomizes the evolving, you know, the jobs, our graduates today, uh, 70% of the jobs haven't even been invented yet or created, as you say. And, um, and, and therefore, you've got to have that ambition, that, that, that flexibility to grow and change and evolve and keep looking for the next development. Um, yeah. 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 And have to have the right mindset. So uh, I know there's a, a saying is it's sometimes it being quoted as a, a saying from Pippi Lankhouse, <laughs> long stopping that is, uh, you know, how is it possible? And then, uh, but there's something like, uh, uh, if you encounter something new, what, what she actually says is, uh, so, oh, I never done that before. So I think I can do it. And yeah. that is something that I really like. It's something that I did in my career. So, for example, when I uh, went from being a teacher to becoming an information designer, which is completely something, okay, let's go for it. And I was uh, asked to write those books. I, well, I never done that before, so let's go for it. So I think if you have that mindset, then basically, uh, yeah, everything is possible. Yeah, brilliant. Well, well, Kasper, thank you so much. The time has flown by and, and we've, yeah. we've come to our, our podcast. And that has been so, so interesting. And, and from your story through to how you're managing um, the, the, the culture of your business and, and rightly, you know, we, we, we didn't go into too much detail, but how you're supporting your offices and especially with your Ukraine office and, and with the world today, culture and support and care is, is the most important things we can, we can help with at the moment. And, and, um, and all the way through to your career advice. So, so Kasper, thank you so much for being on our podcast. It's been a You're great, welcome. great conversation. Um, and to all of our listeners, that is another episode of our Future Tech podcast. The podcast is on our webpage, Arrows Group uh, forward slash podcasts, as well as on the 37 university career portals and on our Spotify channel. Um, to Casper, welcome, a massive thank you. And to all of our listeners, here's another episode of Future Tech.